and thank you for inviting me. Um, we're going to move from biomolecular engineering backwards <laughs> to a more primitive time. And actually, what I'm going to describe to you is, um, in part, a big challenge in mechanical engineering. <laughs> We just use these mechanical engineering challenges to study some prebiotic chemistry. So here's a brief outline of my talk. I'm going to let's see. I'm going to give you a little background introduction, and then I'm going to briefly describe the way we model impacts from outer space using hydrodynamical. Um, simulations, and then I'm going to move on to some impact experiments I've been working on for almost 10 years now, and describe some of the chemistry we've seen in these experiments, and then talk briefly about ongoing work that involves sort of the next step, which is more um, folding in molecular modeling into actually shock shock modeling, so coupling those two. So I'm interested in the prebiotic inventory um, before life happened on Earth. And specifically, I'm looking at uh, extra planetary delivery vehicles. <laughs> They come in three forms, as far as we know. We have interplanetary dust particles, or IDPs. They're asteroids, and they're comets. And so, in this talk, I'm going to focus on experiments that uh, involve cometary impacts. So, if we go back to about four and a half billion years ago, our solar system was condensing rapidly, and it was a pretty chaotic time. And uh, in fact, there are, there are a lot of collisions, and um, it, there was a lot of organic matter too. And this organic matter was concentrated in asteroids, which contain up to five um, weight percent in the in the most carbonaceous, carbon-rich ones, the carbonaceous chondrites, and um, also in comets, where you have up to 15 weight percent um, based on analyses of Comet Halley. Um, in, in meteorites that have come to Earth, we found over 80 amino acids. And some of these amino acids have a very slight enantiomeric enrichment. In other words, they're chiral molecules, racemic mixtures, typically, so 50-50 left and right-handed molecules. But there's this very small, up to a few, a few percent of、um, enrichment in the L form of the amino acids in asteroids. And on comets, since we started this work, actually,、um, we've、uh, or folks at Goddard have observed glycine in actual comet return samples from the Stardust mission. And also, it's been reported that we found glycine in the interstellar medium through、uh, observing, although that has been somewhat controversial. And, and also to supplement this, there are laboratory ice experiments done by Max Bernstein and colleagues and、um, other collaborators in Europe, and they've actually been able to generate, with or without dust, dusty,、um, uh, I guess, grains、uh, mixed with ice, they've been able to generate half a dozen different types of amino acids. So we think there are amino acids out there. And because of that, that's going to be the focus of these experiments I'm going to describe to you. Well, so why why look for an extraterrestrial source of prebiotic car carbon where when there might be a lot of carbon that's generated or, or organic molecules that are generated on the Earth? Well, as I mentioned, there's a lot there are a lot of organic molecules in the interstellar medium, and there are a lot of these comets, especially in the early history of our solar system, that have these essential what we consider to be the essential ingredients for life. This is a very sort of sim simple, simplistic view, but these ingredients are liquid water, source of energy. We certainly have that in the impacts, and also the presence of this organic material. Now, the cometary and asteroid delivery has been、uh, poo-pooed for many years because of the very severe conditions associated with having those, these、um, bodies come to the Earth. The assumption is that there will be widespread destruction. So even if you, bring, if you have organic molecules in the parent bodies, these things will just completely dis dis、um, essentially. Be destroyed in the impact, and secondly, we think we need some way to concentrate organic compounds. So, because these impacts are typically very extreme,、uh, the material will be dispersed widely. So, you have two potential challenges. And also, because、um, for many years Stanley Miller's initial experiment was considered to be sort of the way, the easiest way to generate amino acids, and I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this experiment in which he had. This is actually a picture of the original apparatus. He had a, essentially a,、um, a reaction vessel here, warm water, with、um, mixtures of, of reduced gases, and then he had Tesla coils, so he had a continuous spark discharge. And he let this experiment go. And after about one week, he stopped it because he was getting so much tar, which you can see in this brown here, brown material here. And in addition to that tar, he found、um, 13 carboxylic acids, including six amino acids, at very low yields. 
And the thought was, you know, I think he, he was concerned that if he kept the experiment going, maybe all of this material would become macromolecular tarry, tarry substance. Now, Stanley Miller and others have since um, repeated these experiments in more, uh, with more um, oxidizing atmos or gases, in fact, or much more um, moderately oxidizing gases that we think are, ref are more reflective of the composition of the earlier atmosphere. And you find, in fact, that the, the experiments don't go to the same degree or to the same, same rate. So maybe this, this type of mechanism is not so um, efficient when you have oxidizing gases. We also know, as I mentioned earlier, that we had a lot of uh, bombardment of the Earth in the early, earliest part of our solar system's history. So we know from the lunar, rec lunar crater radar record that uh, it was just the, the impact rate uh, fell off exponentially after about the first billion years of, of history. So once again, very, very harsh conditions on the earth, surface of the Earth. There's also a lot of harsh radiation. So things that were generated in situ on the Earth would have had a hard time surviving. Now, I mentioned this, this uh, lack of efficiency for generating amino acids in, um, in a sort of electric discharge experiments. And now we know that the, this sort of we're getting pressure, the time pressure from the other end because we have older and older records of the first life. And here's, here's just a stromatolite from um, Australia. And this, there are similar samples or similar ages from um, S South Africa. We have uh, ages of between 3.4 uh, to 3.55 billion years. So that means there wasn't, there's only that first billion years of history where we could generate enough concentrated material to um, essentially inspire further chemical evolution. I think Jack mentioned yesterday that another way to generate um, simple organic compounds is through black, black smokers or hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. And uh, th these have been shown to generate uh, long uh, hydrocarbon chains. And in the laboratory, that people have generated peptides as well. But it's not clear whether or not they're, they're depending on a, a metal template that's part of the experimental reaction chamber to help catalyze these experiments. But once again, of the black smokers, and these considered, are considered to have um, lifetimes on the order of 100 years before they sort of self-clog or choke themselves, um, you have the issue of dispersion. So even if you're making the molecules, presumably they'll be carried off in the water and you won't have a concentrated um, source of organics. So overall, was there time to make a primordial soup or concentrate material on the Earth using these sort of terrestrial-based um, production met methods? Another, another, um, another challenge on, through abiotic processes on the Earth is how do you generate this um, chiral excess or, or, or chiral preference that we see in all life? So this now I'm going to go back to um, sort of a... Um, an art, artist rendition of these comet ponds. And so it, maybe 20 years ago, Ben Clark came up with an idea of, or, or mentioned the fact that maybe you could find a very rare, very rare occurrence where you could have a sort of a, a oblique angle impact that would be less harsh than an extreme impact. And in so, so coming in, you could actually have a portion of that comet land as liquid water. And again, the time was thought, oh, that's crazy. The conditions are too severe. But wouldn't it be nice if you'd have these little puddles, essentially chemical reaction chambers, around the Earth where you might have different types of chemical evolution? So we thought this was a pretty, you know, pretty fun idea <laughs> and thought we'd try to actually see if we could take it out of the sort of, the sort of fantastical or, or um, as he called it, geopoetry realm and try to model these types of impacts using um, hydrodynamical modeling. So before I get into um, this more further discussions of impacts, I just want to sort of remind people of the pressures we're talking about here. Now, um, we all know about where we live, one atmosphere of pressure. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, Jack alluded to very, very high, or high pressure yesterday talking about the black smokers. Well, that's pressure at the bottom of the ocean, say under five kilometers of hydro hydrostatic pressure, would be about 500 bars. Now, pressures of about... 10 kilometers of crust at lithostatic pressure would correspond to about 30 bars. But the peak pressures that are sort of the minimum pressures we might expect to find in our impacts of comets hitting the Earth, so a comet hitting a rocky Earth, would be on the order of 90 GPA, or five orders of magnitude higher in pressure. So we really have no intuition for what that means. <laughs> at least, if anyone in the audience has that intuition about that, let me know, because I sure don't. <laughs> So how do we describe, when, another thing about when you have an impact, 
you actually have a discontinuity in pressure. So a very, um, unlike a sort of static pressure, if you step on something, <laughs> or if you, you squeeze something in from all sides, the impact is essentially a, a discontinuity in pressure. And so we describe the, the way the behavior materials, um, unless, unless they fail, beha materials be, um, behave as fluids. And we describe the um, equations of state defined by the response of the materials in, in terms of Hugonios. And that's just essentially um, material behaving like a fluid and following conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And here's a plot of pure ice, pure water ice Hugonios showing pressure versus temperature. And here I've just um, drawn them in. And um, I've also, in this red dot, indicated if you had a normal impact, again, what would that, the, the, the kind of pressure you'd generate in that impact, um, which would be about 90 gigapascals. Now, that's a high pressure. And you might think that, oh gosh, what kind of temperatures would correspond to that? Well, here's where, again, our intuition or, or naive intuition might take us, just read off the plot, oh, somewhere around 6,500 degrees Kelvin, which is pretty darn hot, and we don't think anything organic would, <laughs> we don't know that they would survive that. But in fact, as soon as the pressure wave goes through the material, all the material it releases. And so, in fact, you release that material along an isentropic path, so, in fact, it falls way back down to much lower pressure. There's, it doesn't go down to zero because there is some residual heating based on the properties of the material. But, so, in fact, when, 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 a, mater when a material hits something or, and then you sends, sends a shock wave traveling through the material, everything is compressed briefly and also heated. But um, as soon as it's gone, you drop down to lower temperature. So this maybe gives us hope that perhaps these very fast, relatively fast impacts could... Um, leave some material intact. Um, before I continue, I just want to talk about some of the other re um, response of materials to pressure. So how does pressure affect chemical kinetics? Well, if we look at the um, effect of pressure on reactions involving organic molecules, we can describe them by this simple Arrhenius relation. And by taking sort of some simple values for um, this re the reaction rate is uh, proportional to the exponent of the um, activation energy plus pressure volume term over, the, over KT. And if we take a, essentially a simple E value for amino acid paralysis and a, and a, um, a, a V term, which is typical for bond, um, volume change and bond cleaving, we can substitute these in. And comparing that, you know, if we want to compare how pressure will um, retard this kind of reaction, using those um, PT baths of ice, the breakdown rates via pyrolysis or whatever would be impeded by pressure. So essentially, pressure would retard, retard breakdown. So for example, at 7,000 K and 100 GPA, we have a reaction rate of about comparable to that you'd see at 900 K and one bar. So. Just again, to compare to how shock pressures compare with dynamic pressures, here's a, just an assembly of a, a diamond anvil cell this is a pressure vessel where we squeeze material between diamonds and can go to quite high pressures. But they're static high pressure experiments. Um, and if you look at the plot on a temperature versus pressure line, here you have the Hugonio for water ice for, compared to um, essentially a pressure a reaction curve for um, pyruvic acid breaking down. It's a, it's a typical organic reaction. And actually, you see that the PT slope of the ice Hugonio is shallower than this, this example reaction boundary. So therefore, shock pressure should stabilize this, these kinds of cometary compounds. So you're going to have re a retardation in the reaction rate and also stabilizing them to higher temperatures for a, core, for a given pressure. So this is what we're predicting, that the pressure will actually help to keep things together and slow down chemistry. So now I'm going to move into, again, models in the lab. So our model comet, well, we, how do we model a comet? We don't really know that much about the structure of a comet. Is it a Swiss cheese comet that has lots of porosity, lots of holes? Is it a dusty, dirty ice ball comet? Well, how do we model that? Um, we can make um, simplifications involving density, or using density and using um, averages of density, but rather than overinterpret, we just essentially model the comet as a simple sphere of ice. So it's a simplification, but that's, that's how we go forward. And this is a picture of the the comet that um, the Stardust mission sampled. Okay, in our comet impact model, we, want to, we're, we set it up so we want to try to maximize 
um, the potential to have organic, chem or organic compounds survive. So again, we have simple ice, uh, simple water ice hitting a rocky earth. Now, some of you may be familiar with sort of the classic experiments of Chris Chiba. They're, I guess they're classic now. They're from 1990. And in, in those experiments, he modeled a comet, similar ice ball, hitting oceans and, and uh, generated very high temperatures and high pressures and posited that perhaps some material would survive, but it would be, again, in the ocean, it would be dispersed, and it wasn't clear to what degree this material survived, would survive. Here we're, we're focusing, to, focusing on the comet Earth collision because, again, if we deliver a comet into the ocean, you're diluting your material. And we're trying to have a vehicle that will deliver some material intact and um, some material in a liquid puddle that'll, that'll essentially help concentrate it. So again, we, we model, we're going to go for a very, very oblique angle to try to maximize the, or minimize the harshness of the conditions. And we're going to um, tr model the fluid behavior by breaking the system into a matrix of cells. Essentially, you just make a grid and then calculating the forces that affect each, each grid. And um, you can change the grid size depending on the areas of interest of the comet. And essentially, you can um, average the cell properties and the interactions with the neighbors. So the material in this case, is, it's an Eulerian model, so it flows through a static mesh, and the cells can contain mixtures of materials. In other words, you can have, in this case, water in multiple phases. And um, we, to do this, we, we started out with a simpler code, and now lately we've been using the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory's uh, hydrodynamical code, Geodyne, which they use to model um, uh, bombs. <laughs> so it's, um, it's quite a well-maintained hydrocode, and um, I collaborate with folks there, and, and um, I'm happy to take advantage of their, <laughs> their, act, their maintaining the database that describes the, flu the uh, material behavior. Okay, so what are the model requirements? Once again, we are obey, assuming we're going to obey Newton's laws of motions, cons conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, um, and that we have well-defined and well-characterized material equations of state. So once again, we do know the behavior of water very well. We know the behavior of rock. So we're pretty, um, we're, we're covered here. And essentially, these equations of state just relate pressure to density and internal energy of your material. And these are constitutive models where you have equations that relate uh, stress to strain, strain rate, internal energy, and damage. So I decided, because this is a uh, chemistry symposium, not to show you lots of movies of uh, impacts, <laughs> but if anyone's interested, I have pretty colored movies showing um, comets hitting my model Earth at all different angles. <laughs> so instead, um, essentially, I just want to summarize and say that modeling these comets, this is a 2D representation, lead to opti optimistic predi predictions. In other words, here, once again, is, here's a plot of density, where orange is a high density and blue is low, low density. So you have the comet coming in at, a, at an oblique angle, essentially just smear, smearing along the surface of the rock. It's hardly changing the rock at all. But what's interesting is, the, is that the pressure, the pressure wave passes through on impact, passes right into the rock, and that comet smears along, and you actually can calculate the, the f relative um, distribution of the phases of water in, 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 um, dispersed through this comet. And you find that, in fact, there was a small portion of the comet, the, sort of the rear trailing end, that actually doesn't get as, as hot. So it's only a small percentage, but it, in fact, it makes, it makes a difference. Or rather, it's... it's, it's um, when I mentioned that the cometary matrix is simplified, and even if we're doing these models, we still don't understand the chemical response of, of um, organic compounds to shock. So we're making a lot of assumptions here. But essentially, and also we don't know the kinetics of the organic um, conditions, but in general, if we, if we assume that the organic material is going to um, follow the water. So in other words, if, if liquid water is delivered, we assume that's sort of a, a lower estimate for the amount of organic material that would survive, um, because most organic material breaks down at higher than 100 degrees. Um, so that, that'll give us an estimate of, a uh, lower estimate of how much organic material could come. And in this, in this sort of earlier plot, we have a, only a few percent of the material survives at a, a, lower, a lower temperature, but it's actually, it's, again, it's 1% of the mass of our initial comet, which is, um, about a kilometer in diameter. But if, if we assume, you know, do some back-of-the-envelope calculations and assume cometary material is about 15% organic matter, then a one-kilometer diameter comet could deliver about 10 to 10 kilograms of organic matter just in a single impact. 
And if we look at our best estimates, and again, these are, these are quite unconstrained, but our best estimates of the kinds of fluxes we had in the prebiotic um, Earth in the first billion years, and just here we have terrestrial sources and extraterrestrial sources, just look at the, the orders of magnitude here. That single comet could actually overwhelm all the other sources. And again, you know, these, these are poorly constrained values, but it just it, it, um, it helps justify this sort of pursuit of comets as a, as a um, vehicle for contributing to the prebiotic chemistry. Okay, so continuing, um, we've, as I mentioned, we've looked at uh, more types of scenarios using 3D in the Livermore code, and much more material survives than is, we typically assumed, and um, even though a lot of the material would be dispersed, still a significant fraction would be retained in a small sort of comet puddle. Maybe not as pretty as that artist's rendition, but still con contained in a, in a um, sort of coherent body nonetheless. Okay, now I'm going to move on to laboratory experiments. And um, again, in the laboratory experiments, we're also assuming our comet is, is, is water ice or water. And this, in the laboratory, we're doping it with amino acids. So there have been some related experiments of people looking at um, st static conditions, the stabilities and reactivities of organic molecules at high pressure and uh, sorry, high temperature in one atmosphere. People have looked at organic phase, uh, gas phase shock chemistry using laser drip, laser drip, uh, lasers to drive flyer plates to generate a shock. And also um, people have looked at um, impacts involving solids, either powders or actual um, essentially cored rock samples. But in the solid, case of the solids, there's, there is pore, finite pore space, and when you compress a, um, a gas and then release it, that generates a lot of temperature, and it's very hard to back calculate what the kind of temperature in, um, in your system was, because it's very hard to, to uh, identify the, um, the, the fraction of pore space uh, um, accurately. And finally, there, there's been some studies of uh, shock chemistry of organic fluids, and those typically relate to um, chemical weapon simulants. So I won't talk about this here. Okay, so it all in now going on to the mechanical challenges. Um, <laughs> the biggest challenge of these experiments is actually making a container that will withstand the pressures in our experiments. <laughs> and then, of course, the next biggest challenge is once we get the container to keep its integrity over the course of the experiment, how do you get the stuff out? <laughs> so, um, so I never imagined, you know, as a geologist, geochemist, that um, I would be doing something like this. But I can say to the students, you know, if, if you get curious and get fascinated, and um, you know, you never know where it can take you. <laughs> so um, anyway, here's a here's a, a, a cartoon of our capsule, and it has an aspect ratio of 25 to 1. And by that I mean this white region in here is the fill volume. So we wanted to make it very thin, just like a little, like a, like essentially like a dime or a quarter, because we want to minimize the edge effects of the shock waves going through. And you can think of a shock wave or a pressure wave as essentially similar to a sound wave when it travels through material. As soon as it hits another material of a different density, you have a change in the, the type of speed that goes through, and also you have rarefaction or, or you know, back, back scattering. So we want to minimize the, the, the busyness of our system and try to you know, be able to as closely approximate us over a one-dimensional um, experimental scenario as possible. OK, so we, we, we fill these capsules with, uh, sir, um, using syringes and typically put in about um, 50, um, 50, actually that should be microliters, of aqueous solution. And then we pump it out to eliminate any excess gas to the best of our ability. And this, our samples, we, we, again, we're trying to maximize the chemistry we're going to see. So we picked amino acids that had higher solubility in water and tried to put in a fair amount. And that would correspond, in this case, to somewhere between 5 and 25 milligrams of amino acids. And later, as we changed our geometry a little bit, we were able to up, up, the, um, up, the, oops, up the volume to about 50. So once we have our sample here, this corresponds to this tiny little plug in the center, and we put the sample in a sample assembly. And this is designed, and we, we, we constrained this through modeling, and then, frankly, through trial and error, because there was no recipe book. But we want, as, as the shock wave's passing through, and then you're getting the, the refraction, that it's causing failure. So we want the failure, or the breaks, to occur outside of our, away from our sample. So these are essentially small spalls, and this is just three different um, plates nested concentrically. And here is our, our capsule. So the idea is the shock wave will pass through, and when it breaks apart, if things go well, the capsule will retain and stay intact, and the, the, um, the concentric disk will spall off and take up some of the, the energy. 
Now here's an assembly showing, again, the, the, can, the sample, with a, essentially just a backing plug behind it, and um, uh, compared to the bullet. So the way we generate our impact pressures is we fire, a, you know, in a comet hitting the Earth, the comet's hitting the Earth coming down. In our experiments, our comet, which is our capsule, is stationary, and we're firing a gun at it. So essentially, the, the pressures are generated by this flyer plate, which is it's, um, backed by a sabot, or a, a Malexan projectile that essentially is, is to keep it from you know, wiggling too much as it goes down the, the barrel of the gun. And what we can do is um, we can change the density of our metal, so we can use steel or copper or tantalum, and that'll generate a higher uh, corresponding pressure at a given velocity. And that's, we can also change the thickness of this flyer plate just a little bit, and that'll change the duration of the, you know, of the shock pulse so we don't have a lot of wiggle room in these experiments, but we can play with it up maybe up to uh, an order of magnitude in the, in the, um, the pressure, and maybe, um, I don't know, five to, factor of five in the time. So it's, it's not very much um, room to play with, but it's not zero. <laughs> so here's a cartoon of our gun, and this is an eight millimeter gun, uh, eight, sorry, 80 millimeter gun designed to facilitate soft recovery. So, most of the people who do gas gun experiments take their measurement at the moment of impact. So they're measuring light to come off the, you know, the surface that's being impacted. They're measuring conductivity to come off. And so it's sort of ironic that um, most of the people I met, who actually everyone else I met doing this, they're all guys. <laughs> and they're all wanting to blow things up. And I wanted to recover things. <laughs> so I got a lot of teasing from this. But anyway, so here's an assembly here. This is the barrel of the gun. So that's, that's what the 80, 80 millimeters refers to. And this is the breach down here. In this case, the gun actually used gunpowder to fire. So we actually, something else I never thought I'd be doing is firing a gun <laughs> or um, playing with gunpowder and, um, and, and this starting out in the sub-basement at the University of Chicago. But anyway, so you f um, fire the projectile down here and the capsule sitting here. And if things go well, the capsule, um, the, the small plates break apart. Here's that sample assembly again. And the sample goes traveling right back where it's recovered. Essentially, it landed gently in a bed of felt. Let's see. Oh, yeah. OK, so the, we can measure the impact, impact velocity directly because we have little transducer pins that are actually tripped as the bullet goes driving by. And then we have to calculate um, the other conditions. So, um, kaboom, <laughs> that's about how loud it is. And then um, the sample and plug land in the, in the cash tank. Now, I started out with the cartoon, but I thought I'd show you some pictures of the real stuff, too. Um, let's see. Okay, so here, here is the initial lab where we did the work. It's, um, now this gun is no longer. <laughs> but you can see the barrel of the gun down here, and here's the experiment tank. And here is the soft trapping reaction tank, or catching tank. And here's the open tank. We set things up. Here's our, once again, our sample assembly right here. And then you have the more spalling, you know, sort of protection plates. And so the bullet's going to come from this side, and the capsule will go back that way. Boom. <laughs> so that's after the experiment. And it really, you, it's funny, people are, people are always asking, so how big is an experiment? Is it a big explosion because you're using, I don't know, a couple pounds of gunpowder, blah, blah, blah. Turns out, because it's muffled by uh, seven tons of steel, <laughs> you really don't hear very much. And here's my colleague, Greg Miller, who um, I started this work with, holding the felt after he's just recovered the very first success. We had a lot of trial and error, and um, we uh, didn't give up. <laughs> But these experiments are expensive, and they're, it takes a lot of time with all the precision machining, and we found a lot of sort of nuances in the experimental method that we had to sort of develop through trial and error. So he's very happy here. And then we rinsed the capsule and put it away for safekeeping. Now, uh, since that time in Chicago, and that was about 10 years ago, I've worked at Lawrence Livermore Lab. Um, I actually, uh, they hired me to consult them on uh, how to do soft recovery experiments, which I found very ironic. But anyway, and then um, now I do my experiments at uh, Los Alamos National Lab because the gun geometry is very similar to that initial one in Chicago. But there it's uh, much nicer. In, in Chicago, I would actually have to put on a monkey suit 
after our experiments because we didn't have a lot of technicians, and go into the chamber and vacuum it out myself, and it would take you know hours and hours. Here we have professionals <laughs> who are trained to do that and happy to do that. So here's here's looking down the, the barrel of the gun from the other direction, and here's here's the the reaction chamber here, um, sort of set up before we have a cryogenic capability, so we can start out with ice. And here it is again. And then here's opening it up after you see a lot of fumes. That's essentially just just the plastic and things that have just disintegrated in the course of the experiment. Just some more pictures. And uh, this is a Rusty Gray, who's the um, it's he, essentially it's his lab um, at Los Alamos, and he lets me uh, come in and work in the noise and their budget. So I'm very grateful to that to him for that. And here's what our capsules look like today. They're a little cleaner and they come out nicer. So after an experiment, we I mentioned we, we measure the velocity directly, and then we characterize the histories um, using three parameters. We look at um, the maximum pressure and temperature values that that we um, pressure we, we calculate, temperature we calculate, and then the pulse duration we also calculate. So the the velocity is direct measurement. The impact of pressure is determined from the steel equation of state, and um, the pressure and temperature of the fluid samples are calculated using a essentially a one-dimensional equation of state. And then the shock duration of the pulse time is determined based from the full width half maximum of, of these, uh, of these uh, history curves. So here are just some, some calculated peak fluid conditions. The temperatures we calculated, and once again, we're assuming pure water. So we, it's, it's an assumption that the amino acids present are not going to influence our, our um, equation of state response. But we get temperature ranges of between 330 and 600 degrees C and pressure is somewhere between 12 and uh, 22 GPA. So, so uh, let's do a reality check. How do these laboratory conditions compare with natural, natural conditions? And I, I just have to say that this is about the best we can do in the laboratory to simulate um, this cometary impact. Well, uh, the shock pressures I mentioned, between 12 and 20 GPA, and that would correspond to, that in our experiments, about a 0.5 to 1.2 kilometer per second impact. And, um, or in terms of kilometers per hour, that's 1,800 to 4,300 kilometers per hour, so still pretty fast. But that's much slower than a typical comet impact hitting the Earth today. And that's the normal ballistic impact. If we assume the escape velocity is the minimum total speed we need for an impact, um, to, get, to get down, if, and we also assume that velocity or impact pressure scales with the vertical component of velocity, we can get down to a, um, corresponding to like 16 to 26 0.5 degrees from the horizontal, and the chances of that, based on the lunar record, would be um, slim, 15 to 20 percent. But even smaller, if we try to mimic the velocity or the vertical component of the velocity from short period comets, which are believed to have an average velocity of about 30 kilometers a second, that would be correspond to a very oblique indeed, about 10 degrees from the horizontal, or a very low or rare probability of 3 percent. And um, also, the shock temperatures we're generating are lower than expected for the comet Earth impact because our conditions are really governed by the material of our container. So steel has a higher, a higher density than water, so it's going to have a corresponding lower temperature for the same, same impact um, velocities. Um, and finally, um, in our experiments, we have durations of several micro microseconds. This is uh, three to six times higher uh, or longer duration than you get from the laser experiments, but if, we, if we're looking at a one-kilometer comet as our model, that would generate a, a pulse duration of about one second. So we're off by several orders of magnitude. Now, someone's pointed out to me that, well, if comets are indeed aggregates, you wouldn't have one-kilometer aggregate, so maybe we aren't as far off as we think. <laughs> now, going back to how do we get the stuff out. In the beginning, this, we were, it was very primitive. <laughs> this is Randy Winans, who was one of my collaborators. And initially, we actually just, he, he actually got certified to use this mill <laughs> because we wanted to keep everything as clean as possible in a messy, greasy machine shop. <laughs> so that means we brought our own end mill in and tried to clean it the best we can, we could. Anyway, here he's milling the capsule, and we also mill slowly to, so we don't want to heat the capsule and generate you know, other reactions um, in the course of trying to extract our material. Well, that was somewhat successful, but we had the potential to lose any kind of gases, or if we punctured it, we'd lose um, material as aerosols. So we developed a little piercing device. And in this piercing device, you actually stick the capsule inside, and you machine it down until it's almost at the, almost at the in, in, uh, you, it's very easy to puncture. And then you stick it inside here, and then you actually can seal it off and sample with a SPEMI, or you know, a, a, essentially a, a needle, 
so you can sample any gases in the headspace. Um, and then you can puncture, and we actually stuck a little Teflon uh, umbrella over the puncture needle, so if there are aerosols, they'll precipitate on that Teflon, and then we'll try to you know, essentially recover almost all the material, because that uh, aerosol will form a droplet, and then we'll be able to catch it. So um, essentially, with this way, we can, method, we can recover almost all the liquid, so we think this is a, a pretty good method. So now we have this technique, what do we stick in the capsule? Well, we started out with five amino acids, and this is the glycine, you see the, the sort of the shaded region shows the basic amino acid structure with the different R, um, arms coming off here. And initially we started with um, these, these five amino acids. We picked three that were common in, in life processes and two that were known to be part of, or identified from Murchison, but um, not terrestrial. And then later on we, we added glycine to the mix. And oh, I just mentioned that we assume these are in, in the aqueous solutions, we're assuming that they're, they're, uh, they exist as Witter ions. So a lot of the analytical part of this study is sort of um, LCMS intensive. So we do all of our analyses with um, liquid chromatography and mass spec. And um, for these experiments, we didn't derivatize any of the materials. So we actually started out um, with basic um, amino acids dissolved in water, and we, we processed them in pure form. So, um, and we calibrated everything for quantitative yield because we're interested in the recovery. And here is just a sample spectrum of initial, an initial solution in the retention time versus the relative abundance. And you, you get this uh, retention time uh, is the time it takes to, to pass the material once it's injected in the, in the, in the um, chromatographic column here. And then it goes to the mass spec, and so we, we get the mass abundance too. And so essentially we get th out three-dimensional data. We get abundance um, based on the areas under the peaks. We get um, retention time, that, so separated materials, and we also get a mass to charge ratio. So we can identify the compounds by mass, and we can discriminate using the retention time. And we can compare, whenever possible, to store-bought or other fabricated materials. So here's, um, that I showed you initial spectrum, here's an amino acid um, spectrum after a shock experiment. So you see all, f with the five amino acids, you see they all come out. So, um, in every single experiment we did, we had some recovery. And um, in, in hindsight, maybe not surprising, but for, for a long time, people said nothing, nothing would survive. So we were actually pleasantly surprised. <laughs> and we actually observed 40 to 95% of the survival. The 95% um, occurred when we actually quenched our, or chilled our sample before an experiment. And so because we had so much survival, we actually took away the ice <laughs> or took away the chiller because we wanted to maximize the chemical reactions that would occur. Um, another thing I'm not going to show you here, but we, um, we did look at um, whether or not there was a chiral preference um, in the surviv survivability, and we found actually no, no um, chiral preference in the shock process. So that's not really a surprising result. So how do we compare, and we can compare experiments from one to another? Well, we try to compare them um, all with similar peak shock times, in this case, about one second. And I've ratioed just to, to sort of, uh, it's not a perfect system, but I've ratioed everything against norvaline, just so we can compare them one to another. And this, this shows going from lower pressure to higher pressure, and this red line is uh, no change. And you can see some, like lysine, is, is, has more change, is more reactive with pressure than, say, um, you know, butyric or, um, or uh, phenylalanine, and proline seems to have the opposite response to um, lysine. Similarly, we can look at, um, oops, uh, look at um, time differences and see if there's any kinetic effect we can see. Here's a time difference of about a factor of two for the same max pressure, max temperature. And you can see, once again, we've, we've ratioed the, um, the amino acids to norvaline, and you can see, and the, this is normalized, so this is, would be no change. And um, some, some have shown more of the change than others with respect to kinetics. So um, aminobutyric seems to have very little, little effect, but phenylalanine seems to have more, and so does proline. So we're, we have some ideas as to why these are, these, these, these are but um, I'm not going to go into that here. <laughs> So what, what are some of the reaction products we, we expected? Well, we thought maybe if, um, the pressure is impeding a breakdown, but it's still going to occur. So here are sort of classic re breakdown reactions of amino acids. You have deamination and decarboxylation. But when we went back to look at the um, LCMS spectra, we in fact didn't see any of the lower molecular weight even after we derivatized. So instead, 
we saw um, molecular weights that corresponded to dimers of all of the amino acids. So this is it was, this was an unexpected result because the, the mass distribution was very clean. We saw really nothing except uh, masses corresponding to dimers and to cyclic dimers. So here's what we think we saw. We saw the dipeptides, so two amino acids minus the water to form the dipeptide, and, um, or it could have been an anhydride, although anhydrides are very unstable in water. And then we saw these diketopiperazines, so um, forming or losing two waters in the combination of two amino, two amino acids to form a cyclic dimer. And in fact, as we started looking, we found dimers corresponding to every single combination in our system. So it was really, I mean, that, that was an extraordinary result to us. And um, I don't know if you can see the shading, but we, we actually um, compared with 13 standards we were able to purchase. So we have, uh, you know, sort of verification that these are actual um, dipeptides as opposed to another compound. And with glycine, we actually tried to see how, how much how much further along we could take the, the process. So we, we were actually able to see, see um, one, one challenge with these experiments is that the sensitivity in our mass spec and our, actually our LC2 goes down with the molecular weight. So if we start out with amino acids we can detect, the, um, the dimers are going to have lower sensitivity in the instrument. So there's a trade-off to being able to measure your starting material and being able to measure your um, products. But we found with glycine we were able to see up to five um, uh, I guess a, a five-member um, dipeptide, so a um, te tetra, tetrapeptide of glycine. Um, and so one of the questions we had was, what, what, uh, what sends the reaction to this cyclic, cyclic form versus what, you know, how do we generate longer, longer and longer um, dipeptides, or peptides, rather. Another interesting thing, uh, a feature phenomenon we observed, has to do with pressure effects comparing the... Um, the dimers with each other. And here we've ratioed for two of the linear homodimers. Again, we, we stuck with the homodimers because those, those are ones we could buy from the, um, we could buy standards, so we could compare them. And you see, this is a, um, these are sh shots with same pulse duration, comparing pressure versus the ratio of the peptide over the amino acid. And you see, uh, we don't really know why we see a trend here. Could it be, I mean, is it, is it real or is it um, just, you know, if, just a serendipitous trend, but it, is, it certainly seems to indicate there's some systematic behavior happening for both the lysine-lysine and the norvaline-norvaline dipeptide. And we see less, uh, less uh, trending with these other um, dipeptides. But what's interesting is we see the same type of trend to a lesser extent with the diketopiperazines for um, cyclic lysine-lysine and cyclic norvaline, um, and also sort of more noise for the other ones. So this is something that was puzzling to us. We don't have an explanation for it now, um, although we're starting to model it. <laughs> and then, again, the kinetic effects, um, is there's a lot more scatter here because we have very little uh, t a time difference um, going from about a, a microsecond to three microseconds. But you can see there is some systematic behavior. Most of the dipeptides increase slightly with increased shock pulse duration relative to the individual amino acids. And the one exception is this lysine, um, lysine uh, dipeptide. So um, we're actually extending this work to look at to see, see whether we can um, generate um, any sort of chiral excess when we form the dipeptides. And so that's, uh, that's the topic of a um, talk, talk I'll be giving next month. Anyway, so to summarize what we're seeing, we found amino acid survival in significant fractions for all the initial amino acids we considered, and they tend to polymerize upon impact rather than degrade to smaller molecules. So this is actually, you know, somehow we're harnessing the energy of the impact to form larger molecules, larger organic molecules that are, you know, biologically interesting. And if our experiments are so short compared to potentially a natural scenario, to what extent could we grow these uh, peptides? That's the question we're, we're very curious about. And also, finally, increasing, pre increasing pressure does stabilize amino acids to greater temperatures. And in terms of reaction products, just to summarize, summarize, the bulk of the reaction products appear to be linear and cyclic dipeptides. We didn't see any tarry material, no residual material. We couldn't find anything else. Um, the amount of dipeptides decreases with pressure, and uh, most of the dipeptides increase slightly with increased shock pulse duration. But um, again, we have uh, poor constraints here. <laughs>
So where are we going from here? Well, actually now, um, um, as our computer speeds have gotten better and uh, we have had better access to molecular modeling codes, and um, also as we've, you know, we have access to the, the shock codes that are developed by Livermore Laboratory, we're trying to model and fold in these, um, these uh, reactions into the shock process itself. So essentially, we're using these mixed quantum and uh, molecular mechanics models to try to see how we can solvate explicitly our amino acids of interest and um, then fold them into the, the sort of the hydrodynamical models. And here's just an example of a solvated glycine where we've compared, and in this case, we've uh, solvated it according to the zwitter ion ends, and um, essentially we're, we're ready to fold it in into the shock code. Um, I, if any of you are interested, I want to point out a paper that came out by Neil Goldman and others from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory where they, they illustrate this coupling of um, simple chemistry with the shock dynamics using um, essentially a, a water ice mixture, similar model that we started out with, but they, then they used primitive, ice, primitive gases rather than amino acids, and they used um, uh, Ebenezer calculations and then these uh, um, shock codes and um, to, to essentially back out the kinds of chemistry uh, that we, they're predicting to see in these experiments. And I think this is, a, this is an exciting direction for us because we're going to be able to try to test to see whether we can reproduce through this numerical simulation some of the um, modeling, some of the laboratory results we're seeing. Okay, I'm going to end here, and I want to just thank um, my collaborators. I'm, I showed a picture of Greg Miller, who is, uh, did the initial gun work with me, and I had, had a lot of help in the hydrodynamical modeling from folks at Livermore, um, and also with the chemical analyses. And now I'm working with Nick Winter, who's actually retired from Lawrence Livermore and working on, working on this full time, so I'm very happy about that. And um, experimental design help from folks at Los Alamos and Los Alamos and Livermore Lab. And the, the asterisks by people's names are uh, students who've worked with me on this project. Thanks very much. <laughs>